good, Ken Gonda? It's your boy, O'Shea Duke Jackson, back at it again with another interesting collaboration here on the YouTube channel. I really appreciate everybody here uh, checking in with us today. And I have a, a, a very talented brother that I know. I'm going to let him introduce himself and who he is before we get an interview. Go ahead and introduce, introduce yourself, brother. My name is Drake Bree. I'm St. Louis, Missouri, by way of Clarksville, Tennessee. And uh, before I go into any more detail, I want to first of all thank my ancestors for allowing me this opportunity to speak to you all about my company and uh, as well as acknowledge your ancestors for this exchange. Uh, but like I said, my name is Drake Breed. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, by way of Clarksville, Tennessee. I played professional basketball overseas for 11 years. And uh, I have a genealogy company that helps people uh, gives everyone in the end solutions for people of African and indigenous ancestry. And, uh, you know, throughout my course of playing overseas, I was able to locate my ancestral village and gain citizenship as a Malian citizen. And uh, now I'll be playing for uh, my national team in Afro basket next week for, uh, for uh, representing Mali. Wow. Now that is amazing, man. And coming from, you know, but let's kind of talk about, man, you know, before we get into, you know, the uh, uh, how you got citizenship, man. How did you grow up as an African-American? How did you grow up, man? Tell us about how you grew up in the States. Well, I mean, I was I was like most guys. You know, I, I was just growing up playing ball, wanted to be an NBA player and uh, just constantly competing and, you know, talking trash and doing all the things that, that young, young athletes do. And uh, all of my close friends at the time, we, all we talked about was playing college ball, you know, graduating from college, going pro. It didn't matter if it was football, basketball, baseball, whatever we were all into. It's like we and we grew up in a, in a good neighborhood, too. We came up in a, an affluent neighborhood with uh, I think it was about 40 to 50 percent African-American at the time. And all of us came. Uh, the majority of us had two parent households. And um, and you just I didn't even realize that a lot that a lot of us didn't have two parent households. So I was out of college, but we had a great community. And, you know, you were raised by the community. You know, other people's parents were hard on you, just like your parents. The school system was held you accountable. Everyone was held accountable for everything. And you had to conform to the lifestyle. But uh, but with all that going on, you know, I had a typical upbringing, like most kids, you know, on the basketball court. And I couldn't really see further than uh, than St. Louis for quite some time. And uh, even, even wanting to be an NBA player, you know, it's like uh, I couldn't even think about leaving St. Louis, not even realizing at the time that there was no, you know, even knowing that there's no NBA team in St. Louis. So that type of mentality permeates a lot of uh, a lot of us because we're so focused on what's right in front of us. But uh, as as I began to travel and to live other places, that was able to open up over time. So let me, so let me kind of, you know, ask you this, because when you're coming up, you know, I know you came from up, upper middle class family, uh, African-American family. And did you ever think about uh, you would be in Africa. Like, would you ever, would you think about that when you was in college as a young man, stuff like that? Man, Africa, man, I didn't think about being anywhere, you know, outside the States at all. I remember uh, I was about 13, 12 or 13, you know, you're in middle school and they start teaching you a foreign language. So you have to choose one. And I chose French out the gate. And my mom was like, what you want? How you want to learn French? You know, like, you're never going to go to France, you know? And, and I was like, uh, I said, it's just different. Everyone, everyone picks Spanish. So she, she taught me in the, into Spanish and I ended up not even really using it. And then later on in life, I ended up spending seven years living in France, playing ball. And so uh, she always reminds me of that. It's like, you know, it's like your spirit knew something when you were a kid that you was gonna be over there. And, uh, you know, and, and here I am, you know, I, I've been in France, I was in France for seven years. And uh, and, and that led me to going to Mali, you know, and, and Senegal and some other, other countries in Africa. But that led me to pursue um, what I'm doing now, and now I'm uh, representing my national team. So let's talk about going to France because you know I, I've been in Poland, which is you know nothing like France, where you know you have a lot of French people in Poland from the Francophone countries. But um, how was your interaction with the with the players? Because obviously you know they have a lot of basketball players, but a lot of brothers from France. Did that kind of draw you into uh, Africa by you know playing with the with the with the, with the French black players? Yeah, definitely. I mean. When I was playing in France, it's like 80% of the league is is, uh, is brothers. So it, it really was just like playing at home. 
So, uh, but the difference was the mentality was quite different because a lot of the guys are, were born in Africa. You also have a lot of guys that are Afro-Caribbean, some guys that are from South America. So you have, you, you, it's a mixture of black folks from all over the planet. And you're around these guys every day and building the cool relationships. And you're learning so much more about yourself through their experiences. So they had questions for me growing up in, uh, as an African-American growing up in the States. And I had questions for them because, you know, I wanted to know what Africa was about. And I wanted to know, you know, why they behave differently than we did, than we do, and uh, and, and vice versa. So it, it just was a, an incredible experience, and that's what propelled me into looking to my ancestry because everyone knew where they were from. So different conversations and questions would come up periodically, and it's like I didn't know, you know, anything beyond, you know, St. Louis, and uh, you know, even when I asked certain family members, a lot of them didn't know. But, uh, you know, being around, you know, guys that are from the continent, it's like, I, I have to figure out where I'm from. Let me, before we kind of get into it, let me talk about these uh, behaviors. Because you notice they had behaviors that were different than than us as African-Americans. What were those behaviors that you felt that were different? Well, I mean, it's, it's so many things. I would say, uh, I, I don't know too many guys that are from Africa that have ever been in a fight. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. You definitely I go mean, fight the black community. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, even just getting to the point where you're angry enough to fight somebody. And, you know, I've been at least a dozen fights by the time I finished high school, you know, but mm -hmm. maybe even by the time I started middle school. So that's just that's just the normal thing, you know, uh, you know, the competitive nature of being being in the States. And so being around these guys that are, you know, similar athletes, you know, everyone's competing. It just it just doesn't happen. They can't even think of it. Even when I go to Senegal or I'm in Mali now, I can go in the darkest alley at three or four in the morning and have no worries. Even if I'm in uh, in, uh, in the roughest, you know, most poverty stricken area, I have no worries that anyone's going to do anything to me. And I asked my chief about this several years ago, and I asked him, I "said What are you What are you all teaching the youth here that has them so peaceful?" And he told me, uh, "You know, I was like, because in the states, you know, we have a problem with our youth, you know, uh, being real violent, you know, having a, a you know unfortunate deaths." And, uh, and he said, uh, he thought about it for a second. And he said, you know, I never heard anything like that. It's not a problem here. And I was totally put back. I was like, what? And he said, here in Mali, in Mali, in the neighboring country, neighboring nations, we teach Mara. Okay, Mara spelled M-A-R-A. And he said, Mara mm -hmm. literally means education. He said, but it's deeper than education, it's deeper than the respect. He said, and if anyone gets out of line, and someone else in the community around them understands Mara, they're going to say a few things to them and they're going to stop right away. And I was just like, wow, you know, that's one of those gems that when you grow up away from your home culture or when you grow up in, uh, in another country and you don't know, you know, your your uh, your tribe, your traditions, your name, those are the things that you lose. So I, I was having these very profound experiences and that and that just made me want to go deeper. You know, I want to talk about um you told me you were living in France uh, and there was a specific time you were at a shop and a brother kind of buy something. And that was kind of a, a, a yeah. let's, let's talk. Yeah. Talk about that epiphany that you had there. You so talk about that story there. Well, it, it was, uh, I was about 28 or 29. Okay. And this is when, by this time I had already, started you know pursuing everything i had the dna test done i started you know hammering out a few details but this was the first year that i actually had the opportunity to go to africa because we went so deep in the playoffs years prior to i had i, I just couldn't go but uh but this season i was like all right i'm going this year and you know around this time i really started to understand you know the importance of paying homage to your ancestors you know because that's the first level of spirituality when you're talking about africans from the continent and, and indigenous people you cannot you cannot call on a deity or pray you know ask for things from a hot from the highest level when you're not taking care of your family and so your 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 ancestors are the first level of uh and, and you're not praising your ancestors you're just paying homage paying respect like if your grandmother passed paying respect to your grandmother your grandfather things like that so anyways um as i start learning more about ancestors to this ancestors to that i said all right let me put this to the test you know so i said a prayer one evening and I said to my ancestors that I'm in that are from Senegal and Mali area, let me know if the information that I have is true and if I truly need to go to West Africa at the end of this season. And so about a week later, I was in Chaclay. It's, a, it's an urban area in Paris. 
And uh, you know, I, I was always in shock play, shock play the core area. But anyways, I was um I went into this African shop. And this is the first time I was in the African shop and actually knew what I was looking at. You know, they had the typical garbs, they had the statues, you know, they always have like an altar and a lot of books and different things in there. But this is my first time looking at these ancestors that were in this in this man's store and knowing exactly who I was looking at, what cultures they're from, and what they're about from my from my research and studies. So I started talking to him about it. And, uh, and so the owner store, we're having a good exchange and we're going back and forth. He said, I'm surprised the young brother from the States knows about all this because when most of you guys come here, you don't know or you don't care. And I told him, I said, well, I used to be like that because I didn't know, you know, in the States, you know, it's not really taught in the school system and some people's families know, but most people don't, you know, because of slavery. And so, but I've been in France for the last four or five years. Most of my close friends, you know, in France are, are back in, are, are Africans. You know, so I started picking up on the uh, on the culture and I plan on going to Africa next month. So, you know, as I kept continuing to talk, he has this large wall in the back of his store, you know, filled with ancestors, ancestors from Africa, ancestors from South America, ancestors from the States. And, and uh, as I'm talking, he cut me off. He said, well, when you go to Africa, it's going to be a powerful experience. But don't think it's by chance you came here today. And he raised his, his uh, right arm towards that back wall. He said, the ancestors sent you an invitation. And, you know, at that moment, I was like, Dang. You know, <laughs> I knew at that moment that I had to go to Africa, that this was a this was a, a destined trip. And, uh, you know, when you have these confirmations from prayer, from prayer, you know that you're on the right track. And just a few minutes later, I'm in the same store and I buy a book about Sanjata Keita. So, if, so anyone who doesn't know Sanjata Keita, he was known as the Lion King. So the movie The Lion King is actually based off him. So the Lion Simba will be who Sanjata Keita is. So anyways, I'm, as I'm buying this book, book the, uh, there's a man who walks in the store starts talking to the owner then the owner looks at me and say hey this is the author of the book that you're about to buy uh he's going to sign it for you and uh he's a mendinka and <laughs> and so i was just like hey. <laughs> you know when the ancestors uh when you call them the ancestors they will respond you know and it's just a matter of are you ready to answer the call so uh, that's why our slogan for my company is is the ancestors way you know because the ancestors will show you the way and once you once you pursue them, I would say once you look for your ancestors, they come looking for you. So um, that's what propelled me to go to Senegal and Mali for the first time. And Senegal was great, but when I got to Mali, I knew this was the right place. You know, you could just feel it. In, I could feel it in my spirit. What was what was so uh, now? You know, as far as because you you can speak French, uh, but you know a lot of a lot of the African Americans that know that they have ancestry on the continent of Africa, you know, some of the questions that they're concerned with as well. I don't know how I'm going to be treated because, you know, I've, I've, I'm in America and um, I've had some problems here and there with a few brothers on the continent that come to America. What did you experience when you went to Senegal and Mali for those people who have questions for the first time? I mean, nothing but love, man. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was just a phenomenal experience on, on every level. Uh, and my, my experience was a little different because the guys I was playing with are from Senegal and Mali, are from Congo and other places in Africa. So when I got there, you know, they, they linked me up with their friends and their family members. And, and I already had folks there uh, that I could communicate with and had everything all set up. But outside of the people that I um, that I knew, you know, it was, it was all love, man. You know, um, people are very excited, typically. If you're African American and you come to Africa, now you can have some bad experiences. But you know, I've had bad experiences in the states more so than than uh, than some other places. So it's just a matter of you run into some knuckleheads or not. But overall, I mean, it's it's just it's great. Everything about the the people that I've met has been awesome. You know, you run into a couple knuckleheads here and there, but overall, it's just a, it's a great experience. And it's really um, when you hear about some of the bad stories. You know, because everything is not all, all peaches and cream. And that's that's no matter where you travel. You know, I have story. I have horror stories from traveling to different countries. All, I've been to over 20 countries. It's something that pops off, you know, in almost all of them. But that's life, you know. But at the same time, if I count the, the number of things that have happened to me growing up in the States, I mean, which, which side was uh, is going to outweigh the other? But when you're pursuing your ancestors and your, and your direct ancestors, <clears throat> to be specific, your direct family members, then that is going to uh, be of, of vital importance and that should overweigh any any conflict uh, that you might have. 
let, let's talk about, you know, uh, you know, because obviously your company specializes in helping people in the diaspora. A lot of people are looking to go, uh, you know, to, to Africa, especially West Africa. Now you have countries like Sierra Leone, which I think helps your case because Sierra Leone, if you can prove, um, I know Brother Dynast Amir, you were on his show earlier today. Uh, he was able to get not only Nigerian citizenship through something, but by through DNA, he got Sierra Leone citizenship. Um, you see people in the, the, the uh, African Americans in Ghana getting citizenship. So in Sierra Leone is starting to, you know, really give brothers and sisters citizenship with like no strings attached. They can approve they're from there. Um, how uh, how hard was it for you to find out um, your ancestry and, and what and how does your co- company help people find out um, exactly where they're from on the continent. Well, you're talking about a guy, when I first started off, I didn't know anything about genealogy or Africa other than just what I saw on TV and that was it. So I started off as a total novice years, many years ago. But now, uh, but through all of these different twists and turns, um, there has, you know, we've created a great formula that works for everybody. So it doesn't matter if you have African descent or indigenous descent, we'll get you where you need to go. So it would take you much, it would take you less than a year for sure to figure out the vast majority of everything that's going on in your family lineage. Well, it won't take that long at all. Um, and that's and that's on the long end. Uh, because now that we know the the, the way, uh, it, it's much easier, it's much simpler to get these things done. But um it, it was it was a grind. I mean, it was a grind, but it's an exciting thing. Anytime you are looking into your family lineage, there's so many things that can be gained from it. you. People have found inheritances. You know, uh, we have students that have that have, uh, you know, hit all kinds of milestones. We just had a client where we located their village, you know, in West Africa and in Sierra Leone. And I, I have Sierra Leonean ancestry as well. And so when you're proving, uh, when you're going through citizenship and things like that, you have some countries, it depends on the country. Some countries will rely on just the DNA test. You know, other ones you have to actually prove um, how how your direct lineage is attached to that country. So like for me, I had to show my genealogy research. So I have up to seven generations, you know, so the seven generation were the ones who were brought to America from Mali. So I could tell you down to the village. So I'll give you an example. I have four Malian ancestors that are from Kai Mali. Okay, the first two came over in 1855, and the second two came in 1865 and 1866. So four people came on three separate occasions. So the first two, Thomas and Annie were, okay, Annie was formerly known as Akita, okay, and Akita is, is uh, one of the original Malian names, uh, similar to how Sanjata Akita. A lot of people in Mali's uh, last name is Akita. That's one of the original Mandinka and Malian names. Okay, so. Uh, those two were captured in, in, in a station in Fort Medine Slave Fortress off the Senegal River in Kaimani. And then they were transported up to St. Louis Senegal, which was the major slave port of its time. And then they were transported to Havana, Cuba. And in Havana, Cuba, they were sold separately. So Annie was sold to the New Orleans, uh, to the New Orleans Slave Port. And in the French Quarter, she was sold to a plantation just north of New Orleans. And she escaped up the Mississippi River to West Helena, Arkansas. Now, Thomas, he was sold to Galveston, Texas from Havana, Cuba. In Havana, Cuba, some, at some point or another, he got tra- he got, a, he got sold to a family in, uh, in, in West Helena, Arkansas as well. So the two reunited in West Helena, Arkansas, and they wanted to be married. But, the, but Thomas' slave owner did not allow any of his slaves to be married. He wasn't, he wasn't for them. So, but, but the slave owner ends up getting very sick to the point where he was ne- about to die. And Annie knew how to heal people using African uh, medicine and uh, African, uh, you know, healing, healing arts. And she and so her and Thomas told the slave owner, hey, we can save you. We can heal you, but you have to allow us to be married. And so the slave owner agreed. And as he and, uh, and once he made a full recovery, he, he, uh, he kept his word and allowed them to be married. So that's why our family's uh, uh, first name in the States is word, because the slave master kept his word and allowed our first uh, two modeling ancestors to, uh, to to be married. And so their children, okay, their their, first, uh, their son, his name was Thomas Word II. And that's my great, great, great grandfather. He married my great, great, great grandmother. Her name was Lucinda Word. And both of her parents are also from Kaimali, okay? 
and one and her mother's last name was also Keita as well. So she lived to be 108 years old and died in 1980. So all of the elders in our family remember her, and she passed out a lot. She passed out a lot of information, okay. And so we were able to, um, you know, connect the connect the dots with my, you know with modern documents as well as stories passed down, and uh, and able to, you know, when it was time to submit this information to be uh, naturalized, it was a done dot. It, it, that was it. Wow. So you found all of that. Let me let me ask you this. So. For those African Americans, because you know on this channel, King Ghana, we have over thirty-one thousand people. A lot of people uh, have said they've been inspired to go to Uganda, Gambia, you know Sierra Leone. Obviously, you're a Malian citizen, um, and a lot of us we understand American citizenship. But what does Malian citizenship allow you to do, and what's the power of having that passport in Mali? Because some people are like, well, you know, the, the you know citizenship in Mali or West Africa is not really so strong. But what is the power of having that Mali passport um, right now, and you know, as being a citizen? I, I, well, you have I have all the similar rights that I do in America. You know, I'm protected by this government. You know, I'm allowed to buy land and uh, run business. I'm able to uh, to to go to all of the West African Ecowas countries without a visa. So I, I check out uh, every every chance I get. I go to a new country and just check it out. So you have those things, but there's so many different levels of it. So it really depends on the person and what you're looking to do. If you're a builder and you're someone that's looking to build, you know, generational wealth, yeah, then, then uh, going to an African nation where your ancestors are from is a perfect place to start. You also are building up a, a high level of equity in your in your personal uh, in your personal development because now you're able to start learning your native language. You're able to start. Um, understanding where these uh, these generational curses and things may have started so that you can address them. And that's one of the big things about genealogy that, excuse me, uh, that's one of the big things about genealogy that has come into fruition. You're able to see where some of these behavior uh, patterns and some of these things started and what was going on. And then you're able to address it and then heal everyone below. And so th those are one of the, uh, those are some of the major things. But to get back to, um, you know, the power of your passport is really what you make of it. You know, a lot of people live in the States and they're not doing anything with what's going on with, with the, the opportunities that are in the States. And there's way more opportunities in, in the States than there are in most of the countries or, uh, in, in the planet. Um, so it really depends on the individual on what you're looking to accomplish. You know, it's, it's funny you said that because if I had, I mean, citizenship in another African country and I talked to Wardy Mai and wow, I mean, the things that he has, you know, he's able to do, move freely, inside connections i mean how do the people treat you now that you're a citizen before when you were just coming to mali and reconnecting do you feel like you actually uh have a deeper connection to the community now after you've been naturalized i i think the uh, i think the connection was to me before i got naturalized at all because what you're talking about is there's a there's a large portion of yourself that has been lying dormant because you've been away from your origin so just simple things such as the sun hitting your skin, the simple things such as hearing your native language, eating the, eating the foods uh, that, that are native to your, to, your, to your system, to your body, those things will start to activate you and connect you right away. And it's like you've heard this music before, but you've never been here. You've tasted this food before, but you've never been here. It's because those ancestors that live there are inside of you. They're inside of your DNA and they're waking up. They're waking you up. So those, so those are some of the things that uh, that you can look forward to. You know, let me um, talk about you know the the you know the process of you know finding out because some people obviously you know you talked about you know Sierra Leone you, you have that uh, and also uh, Mali. So when you got you found out the other what, what 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 parts of the continent did you find out you were from and how did you make a decision on okay. I have lineage from here, here, and here, but I want to settle here. How did you make that decision, and what were your what was your admixture? Well, I was propelled into Mali, okay, because that was the first side of the family that I that I actually dove into. I had both tests done for both sides of my for both of my parents, but because I was in France amongst uh, amongst more Malians, I didn't really know anyone from the from the other sides uh, from the other origins, so I was propelled into that. And when I got, when I, um, the last day I was in Mali the first time, 
you know, one of my Mali and uh, t- former Mali and teammates hit me up. It's like, I want you to be my coach. And so I was like, man, you know, I have a lot of things to do, man. I'm, I really wasn't planning on, you know, meeting anybody for sports or anything. Like, I got to meet the chief. I got to do this. I got to do that. He said, hey, man, just meet him. So I'm like, all right. So I go to this restaurant and I look up with this coach and he's a fresh guy. He already knew who I, who I was and I could play and everything. And uh, so he's asking me a bunch of questions about why I'm there. And, you uh, know, and then then another man comes in from the from the uh, from the federation, you know, he was in a hurry, you know, running into place. And I, I was thought it was like I was a little thrown off that he ran in so hard. And then then he came in, then then he came towards me and said, Oh man, I thought you were gonna leave before I got here. So as this was going on, I was like, Man, something I felt like something special was about to happen, and it did. So, you know, he was asking me similar questions and I was breaking down, you know, my research and why I was why I was in Mali. And uh, you know, visiting the villages and, and, uh, and backing up the information that I had, and, uh, and and so they were both like, you know, we're very impressed that you came this far, and uh, and, and uh, you know, keep keep searching, you know, you know, keep keep pursuing your research, and we don't know if you'd be interested or not, but we're getting ready for uh, for our national team tournament, and we would love if you played with us on the national team. So at that very moment, I mean, you're talking about all of the things that had transpired from the conversations with my teammates leading up to me going to Mali. You know, for, for the man in the shop, you know, giving me, a, you know, telling me the ancestors sent you an invitation. Just speaking to my chief and realizing at that moment, that's why I needed to be in France so that I could speak French to him and explain what was going on so he can give me uh, more information and, 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 uh, and connect these dots. You know, to now, you know, I'm being in a situation where these, these blessings are coming to me you know, to be naturalized. And so, you know, as they're working, as they're working on my documents and we're putting everything together and taking the pictures and filling out all the paperwork and stuff, you know, I'm totally in the daze because I didn't expect any of this, you know? And then they looked up at me and, and was like, man, you know, you okay? Or what's, what's up? I said, man, you don't understand. You know, I'm like, my ancestors were taken from here, you know, hundreds of years ago. And I've been here for three or four days and I'm about to get it all back. And it just it's just one of those moments. It's like it's like a movie. Like I couldn't I could have never planned for anything to happen that way. And uh, you know, and now to be in a situation to where I'm about to be put a Mali in uniform on and represent, you know, where my where my or where I'm truly from. Uh, it's just a special it's just gonna be a special occasion, man. And I'm and I'm trying not to tear up the body, man, but it's 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 powerful, it's heavy. You know, let me let me ask you uh for people you know who are interested in um you know let's say other co- companies that that do it uh what are some of the you know genealogy companies i know that you have one what's different from you and you know some of the other genealogy country companies out there that do similar things what what's the difference that you that you offer that maybe other companies don't well i've i've uh, i've watched a lot of different uh programs and i've and i've a lot of different genealogists and a lot of people have a lot of different skills but i think the number one thing that we have over others is that we can locate your village and that's really what you need okay because the information prior to like let's just say that your family is from egypt or from congo you can find out the information about the tribe prior to that you know because you can just contact someone and they can tell you but you want to know what happened to your direct ancestors so the information that from someone of the diaspora, whether you are Afro-Caribbean, if you are uh, Afro-European and your family was in, in the States or in the, in the Caribbean and then moved to the to Europe, or if you're uh, from South America, from Brazil or Argentina or somewhere, Colombia, or if you're African-American, the main thing that you need to figure out is what happened to your family within the last couple hundred years, because that's what's missing. And that's the gaping hole that has everyone lost. So you might you might figure out some things that happened 100,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago that have nothing to do with your direct ancestors, nothing at all. It's, it could be helpful to a certain extent, but what's going to help you the most is knowing exactly where your ancestors are from. And you can start from there and fill in all the gaps up to modern day. And that's what we specialize in. We have an end-to-end solution uh, starting from modern day, and we can get you back to your village, okay, so that you can put yourself together again. And fix all of the uh, all of the different things that uh, that have been that may that may be plaguing your uh, your family right now. So if you look at these generational, uh, if you're looking at this trauma and a lot of the behavioral situations that are uh, that are plaguing different communities, 
if you, you can you can figure those things out right when you put up the genealogy chart and you can go boom boom all right three generations ago five generations ago this happened to such and such and such and such and blah 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 and then and you can put it together but you need to know the ancestors okay so if you go and get a dna test and it just tells you oh yeah you're from you know gabon or you're from equatorial guinea okay so what i'm from i'm from missouri you know so they'll so you don't want to just get these fractions you want to have a roadmap of mm -hmm. your family okay mm -hmm. and that's what's going to give you true power we have people that have found inheritances that they've recaptured we have people that have found land that they recaptured we have people that have healed all kinds of different things um that you know now that uh now that they know they can do something about it okay? mm -hmm. and all of these things are available your your genealogy is is more important than your social security card okay mm -hmm. It's like everything about you on paper, okay? So everything that's already inside of you that you might not have known anything about, you're able to lay it out and look at it and analyze it and do something about it. And these are tangible things that are very beneficial to you right now. All right. So if they want to get in contact with you, who who all would they, you know, what would they need to do as far as contacting the Sankofa Global Exchange and things like that? What, what's the process? Well, you go to the website, sankofaglobalexchange.com. That's S-A-N-K-O-F-A, globalexchange.com. And we have our phone number on there. So you can give us a call, send us a text message, or you can also email us at info at sankofaglobalexchange.com. We're also on all the media platforms. We're on IG, we're on Twitter, and we're on, um, uh, we're on Facebook at The Ancestors Way. And we also have a YouTube page called Sankofa Global Exchange. So you can you can uh you know you can watch our videos on YouTube. You can uh you can right now I'm doing a bunch of things uh on, on IG and uh and Facebook because I'm over here in Mali now where we just started practicing for uh for Afro basket, which is next week. So it's a lot of uploads and different things, but it's just I'm just showing you the importance of genealogy. And one of the things I didn't touch on is having a passport <clears throat> if you're an overseas player. Like now I'm counted as, as an African player and not an American player, which which can extend your career and put you in better situations. Because when you play overseas, <clears throat> there are limits on, as to how many foreigners can be on each team. So some leagues, there might only be one American that can be on the team. There might only be three Americans that can be on the team, so on and so forth. It just depends on the country. Some countries even have it to where maybe you can have two Americans, but only one can be on the floor at a particular time. So. But once you uh, once you have another once you take advantage of your other nationality, now you're able to be in a, in, a, in a different bracket. So you have you have those type of opportunities as well. Okay, okay. Well, definitely check out my brother. You know, I know him, I've known him for me a few few years. You know, brother brother uh, search for who you know you know me from the same city. So brother's doing a great thing. Really hardcore pro black wants to help the community. So I thank you for you know your time. I know you're currently right now in Mali. I know the internet. We've been playing a little bit of phone tag, trying to get this done. I know you've been trying to get on. Hopefully we can get you back on. Uh, you know for the Black History Month thing we're talking about doing. So guys, make sure you go to the first comment pinned at the top. I'll have all this information there as well as the YouTube channel. And as you know, keep it real, King Ganda forever. We out.